Athletic clubs may come and go, but the Mariloma Club seems to be here to stay. This year is the Mariloma's 60th anniversary about the club's history. Why is the uh, As I've mentioned before, we have quite a rich heritage in, in our alumni mm -hmm. and our founders, of which there were 12, and there are uh, about half of those still living. And we thought that we could combine the oral history that they could provide us, mm -hmm. some of which is publishable and some of which we will only tell uh, We'd over the beer. rather keep in the closet. <laughs> um, but uh, we have the opportunity to interview these, these men and women. Mm -hmm. We took that opportunity. We now have a, a, a library of oral history, and uh, we thought that uh, with those people here and with the banquet coming up, that we would take the opportunity to publish our history before too much of it's lost. And you'd be amazed how many photographs and relics and mementos disappear. And uh, Over the years. yeah, we're not we're not going to risk that anymore. We want to get it down on paper, and then uh, if we want to write. An update in, in, at the 75th anniversary will do that. The group of 12 young swimmers who called themselves the Mermaids. They officially became their alone. When they applied for a membership uh, in the Canadian Amateur Swimming Association way back in 1924-25, uh, they were asked the question while well, the answer was no. They actually had a meeting and they had lots of suggestions for a new name. And one of the members suggested taking the first three letters of Mermaids, which was M-E-R, and uh, taking the first two letters of the first letter of the Greek alphabet, which is alpha, mm -hmm. and then the first two letters of the last letter of the Greek alphabet, which is omega, so you got Marilom, and uh, taking the first letter of A from always, and the, the me word meaning, term meaning, like mermaids first, last, and always. And uh, has since become kind of Marilomas, once a Marilomas, once a Marilomas. Oh, always a Marilomas. Yeah, that's kind of the motto. So uh, the, the, uh, the club members liked that name, Mariloma, mm -hmm. and uh, among all the other names that had been suggested, and that was 1925. The Mariloma Athletic Club was incorporated as a nonprofit society in the 1960s. Today, with over 400 active members, it is devoted to the development of amateur sport through rugby, football, volleyball, basketball, softball, and field hockey. Tom, can you talk a little bit about the importance of amateur sports? Well, in our club, uh, we feel that we have a very special role to play in the community because uh, you have, in amateur sports, you have the universities, which uh, provide uh, a large but not necessarily complete program of, of team sports. And you've got uh, community groups like ourselves. And uh, if a kid doesn't go to university, or even after he's finished university, if he wants the team sport experience, then it's got to come through clubs and organizations like this one. That's why uh, uh, we're so large presently is because um, the uh, other clubs and groups that may have only one team or one sport mm -hmm. uh, tend to founder and they, you know, you have new teams one year and new teams the next year. We've been here for a long time and I think that uh, that, uh, the heritage when, when, say when the players are training and, and going out there on the field, is there the same sort of feeling of competitiveness as there would be in a professional sport, or is there more the feeling of we can be competitive and still have a lot of fun? Um, in, in, our, in the sports that we have, we have, I think, two categories. We have competitive sports, mm -hmm. and we have uh, recreational. For example, our women's basketball team is basically a recreational team. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, in rugby, um, our players uh, compete at the highest level. We have players representing Canada uh, abroad. And if you think of it in the context of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, in their country, they are as famous in their country as uh, the most famous hockey players are in our country. When they come here, they might get two or 3,000 people to a game playing against Canada. But yet, they're, you know, it doesn't have the same drawing power, but the same excellence and degree of excellence is sought for here with our rugby players. So they are the best players in this country, some of them, uh, and in their sport. Just like in any other sport, uh, you have the best players who happen to be professionals. When the Mariloma Club was formed in 1924, the members would meet at a little confectionery booth on Kitts Beach. But the membership grew so quickly that they soon needed their own clubhouse. After the Second World War, they found this building in Connaught Park in Kitsilano. This now serves as the home of the Mariloma Club. Inside is a place to socialize, a place to meet, a place to play darts, 
but most importantly, a place to store a lot of memories. After the war, uh, we, we had a room in the back, and, and a few years later we had two rooms, and uh, after a while we had three rooms, and now we have uh, on lease from the Parks Board the entire building. And I might add that uh, when we reconstructed the, uh, the west wing of the building, uh, we received a Heritage Award from the city for preserving the, the architectural integrity of the building, which is really quite handsome. So your clubhouse is actually a source of pride in itself then? For Very the much so. Club. Very much so. And be involved in different events. Have you noticed any changes that have happened in the club over the years? Well, not too much. I guess right now there appears to be more uh, co ed uh, mm -hmm. uh, activity. How do you uh, feel about that? Well, I think it's, it's a good idea, but. Uh, Back in the, uh, in what well, I refer to it as the old days, mm -hmm. uh, we had quite a participation at that time uh, of girls who uh, in the swimming uh, club, and uh, they also played. Back then, uh, the feminine uh, membership was, was, was there, yes. Although women were involved in the Mariloma Club in the early 20s, the Mariloma Constitution of 1928 limited the club to white males only. However, these forms of discrimination have long since disappeared. How was that accepted by the Mariloma members? Was there ever a feeling of male dominance? When I don't think they, for the most part, they really meant it. But uh, yeah, this was one of the, uh, the last strongholds of, of male chauvinism. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, it's certainly accepted now, with no problem. What difference has it made in the club? Do you feel there's a different aura about the club because of the female involvement? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a totally integrated club, uh, recreationally, socially, and, uh, and in every way. Uh, uh, they've added, uh, I think, a tremendous impetus, impetus to the club. Uh, it, it's certainly given, given us more of a, uh, a community base. Mm -hmm. okay. How many women's grass hockey teams are there? There are four ladies teams and one junior team which gives us approximately about 60 players and the same number of teams as the men's rugby has. So the women's grass hockey actually is a really dominant sport then in the Mariloma Club? It's probably the largest of the ladies sports. Mm -hmm. We don't have maybe as many members as the men's rugby but we do have as many teams. We're, in, we're increasing. We outnumber them in softball. We have two ladies softball teams to the one men's softball. Basketballs even. We also have ladies volleyball. The men's don't, men don't have a volleyball. And we have, we've just taken in ladies' soccer. The, the club itself has developed a, a determined pride in its athletic achievements and how a team performs. And these, again, are, are not real objects that you can touch and feel, mm -hmm. but they have become part of the objects of the Mariloma Club, the Mariloma Institution. And, uh, it's things like this club pride, the initiation ceremony, the, the, uh, the club, actually the foundation of the club, and it's still in the Constitution as an amateur athletic in, uh, body, was something that the club really prided itself in and, and really fought to maintain. Even today, and uh, as I had talked to you before with the, the football, mm -hmm. it became professionalized. It started to become professionalized in the late 30s, and the Merrill almost just wouldn't have anything to do with it. The, the pride in being self-supported and amateur is, is something that is still maintained and is very important to the club's uh, continuance where you find certain clubs will come in, take a football, a junior football club mm -hmm. will come in, they'll put in tens of thousands of dollars to produce a winning team, but that club may only last, you know, 10 years, them, say 10 years for a good number. Whereas the Marilomas were an, a founding club of the Junior Big Four League in 1947, and they're the only club that's still in that league. What do you think has been the uh, cohesive force that has kept this club together since 1923? 60 years. It's a long time. Uh, I've had several members say that we, they always had a lot of fun. The fun? The fun aspect. Um, they enjoyed each other's company. Uh, they got along well. Uh, it was kind of a a break from uh, from work mm -hmm. you know I, I, even today you look around and look at the uh, the number of, of uh, activity programs that are going on and all, all you know lines of physical endeavor fitness training and sports and 
But at that time, there wasn't. There weren't a lot of clubs around that people could, could join, or there weren't a lot of uh, places they could go to, to uh, play sports. And uh, I think uh, the fact that the Mariloma Club was organized, and they offered a, a basically a, more than one sport, always. Uh, and the, and the people got along well together. <laughs>